All right, this is from the 9-11 Commission. Uh, Richard Benvenisti is interviewing um, Ben Sliney, the operations manager at the Federal Aviation Administration, and Monty Belger, the um, acting deputy manager at the FAA. And this interview took place June 17, 2004. Let's see what happens. First of all, I would like to express my uh, <coughs> congratulations and profound respect for the men and women uh, on September 11th who got the planes down. Yeah, this let, was me, an let me talk about this for a little bit here, just to inform you. Ben Sliney's first day at the FAA, his first day at the job was September 11, 2001. Uh, he was the he was a, a 25 year veteran of the FAA, um, so it's not like he was brand new, uh, but he was brand new at this position, and he's a hero, uh, unquestionably he's a hero, and nobody really recognizes him for what he did. After the planes were hijacked and crashed into the World Trade Center and into the Pentagon, Ben Sliney did something that was unprecedented in history. He ordered the national stand down of all planes. And it's never been done before. In doing so, because I am of the firm belief through evidence that uh, is public that there were extra planes that were going to be hijacked that day and that um, they didn't take off because of this stand down. I believe the stand down took place at 10 20 a.m. Could be wrong about a couple of minutes, but yeah, this guy, unbelievable. And to do this under pressure, and he didn't get any, he didn't get authorization from the White House or anything. He was on his own dime, but he had uh, the administrators at the FAA um, agree with the, with the call. Extraordinary effort. So probably saved thousands of lives. To safely land over 4,000 planes that were in the air at the time of the hijack. Having said that, I was struck by Mr. Sliney's observation that he had no idea that terrorists could learn how to fly and take over a commercial airplane. Now, it's no secret that we have repeatedly observed that one of the failures of 9-11 was the inability of the government uh, to share information which it had in its possession prior to 9-11 that could have helped the common good, could have helped others <laughs> prepare defensively to deal with what was perceived as a threat. So I will ask the question, as I have to others, whether any of, any of you were advised that on August the 18th, 2001, the Minneapolis office of the FBI uh, sent a detailed memo to FBI headquarters Describing the Massawi investigation, Massawi had been arrested the day before, and describing uh, the facts as uh, believing that Massawi and others yet unknown were conspiring to seize control of an airplane. And that was based on Massawi's possession of weapons and his preparation through physical training for violent confrontation. Now, a little bit Did of any background. Of you let, me, let me talk about the little bit of background on this, right? So I'm going to go back 10 seconds. All right, so Massawi, Zacharias Massawi, is a uh, Moroccan uh, who was living in, in France and then Germany. And while he was in Germany, he was in France. Uh, it was uh, alleged through uh, foreign intelligence that he was meeting with some nefarious individuals who had terrorist connections including Abu Hamza al-Masri. Um, 
who is known by his hooks on his hands. Um, he's currently doing life here in the United States for conspiring to kill Americans. Um, now, this intelligence, uh, which was uh, sent to FBI headquarters in Minneapolis when Musawi was arrested by the FBI there, uh, comes at the heels of Musawi coming inside the United States two weeks prior to September 11, 2001, and contacting on the day, uh, sending out emails and phone calls to flight trainers in uh, Oklahoma. And then when he couldn't get anything going in Oklahoma, he went to Minnesota and he was traveling with a companion named Hussein al Um, And one week prior to September 11th, uh, Musawi and al Athis, who he met at Masjid al Salam in Oklahoma City, um, the mosque uh, over there, um, he was staying at a hotel in um, Minneapolis. And he contacted uh, a flight instructor by the name of Clarence Prevost who basically, uh, I'm sorry, no, it wasn't Clarence Prevost. It was two other individuals and I, I forgot their names, but he was sending them emails. Like, you know, he wanted to fly a Boeing. He didn't want to start small. You know, he has a lot of money. And they actually said, oh, like other Arab students, you know, they like to, you know, chase women and tell them that they're pilots and big shots, um, you know, when, when they receive training. But they also found some of the questions quite unnerving, um, including that he didn't care about landing the plane. Um, he wanted to know where the oxygen uh, shutoff valves were, stuff like this. And so the individuals reported him to the FBI and the FBI basically took an interest. And so when they interviewed him at the hotel, it was Hussein al Atis who they put to the side and Hussein al Atis told him that Musawi basically wanted to kill Americans wanted to hijack planes, came right out and said it. And um, on Hussein al Atta's possessions was a martyrdom will. Musawi had a laptop, he also had a briefcase inside the hotel room. Now, they can't search that without a warrant. And because he's a foreign national, they had to get um, a, uh, a FISA warrant. Now, they had to go through the proper channels about a FISA warrant. Um, and so they had to go through the Radical Fundamentalist Unit in Minneapolis um, and apply with an application uh, regarding the definitions of what, you know, the, what, what met the definitions of a FISA warrant relating to Massawi. Um, the FISA is in short for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, FISA. Um, uh, Foreign Surveillance Court, uh, so they had to go through the proper channels to get through this. And so the people responsible for the unit is Mike Mulpey, Dave Frasca, and its supervisor, um, Marion Bowman. Uh, and so because Samit opened it up as an investigation and not a criminal warrant, they basically said, well, um, well they, they, they redefined the definitions of certain words in the warrant. And the arresting officer was Harry Salmon, of the FBI. And he uh, argued that Musawi definitely was going to conspire to conduct air piracy, which is a federal crime, um, and uh, conspiring to destroy American uh, uh, buildings and kill Americans. And so over the days, French and German intelligence, a uh, French intelligence began coming into the factions at the FBI in Minneapolis about his connections with uh, certain groups uh, that he was associating with, including one missionary group that um, himself and a couple of others at the Masjid al Salam in Oklahoma. Now, the Masjid al Salam in Oklahoma uh, had no idea about Musawi's uh, agendas here in the United States, so they're cleared of any wrongdoing. So just because they received Musawi doesn't mean, or Hussein al Atas doesn't mean that they were conspiring with 9 11 attacks. There's no evidence to justice. Um, a great book that details all of this is Mitchell Gray's I Heard You Were Going on Jihad. I 
absolutely recommend this book. It was one of the best books I've read regarding Zacharias Musawi. Fantastic. Get the book. Um, and Zacharias Musawi's brother uh, wrote a book as well. My brother, Zacharias. Uh, fantastic book. Um, and it goes to show that, you know, Musawi didn't grow up to be a terrorist. You know, he had a troublesome lifestyle and you know, basically ran into trouble. So it's a process. You know, nobody wakes up to be a terrorist. Anyway, they didn't get the FISA warrant. It wasn't approved. Minneapolis created a big deal. This is a huge deal. And it was argued to even years later in the courts. Um, one of the legal counsels at Minneapolis for a long time was Colleen Rowley. And she wrote a scathing letter to di director of the FBI, Robert Mueller, about bureaucrats in Minneapolis and how they obstructed uh, a, a criminal investigation into Zacharias Musawi. How he's possession. So, big deal. ...of weapons and his preparation through physical training for violent confrontation. Did any of you receive that information in words or substance? I did not. On... August 27th, the FBI supervisor in Minneapolis, trying to get the attention of those in headquarters at FBI, said he was trying to make sure that Masawi, and I quote, did not take control of a plane and fly it into the World Trade Center, August 27, 2001. Did anyone receive in words or substance that information? No. No. Hmm. Finally, in characterizing, in a briefing to CIA Director Tenet later in the month of August, the headline, Islamic extremist learns to fly, Mr. Slime. If you had had such information, and going back to the question of the toolbox available to you, and individuals uh, as yet unnamed, according to the suspicion uh, highly educated uh, by the Minneapolis office of the FBI uh, uh, had the intention to take over a commercial airliner, that they, that at least one of them had received flight training and had sought flight training for commercial airliners, recognizing the ongoing intifada, we don't have to go all the way back to World War II and the kamikaze. Various of my colleagues have talked about the repeated uh, information coming from the intelligence community that uh, suicide bombings, suicide hijackings uh, were in the toolbox of the other team. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, look, the, I said it before that there was intelligence, especially in the year 2001, right in the spring and summer, that was coming even from foreign intelligence, warning the United States, even though it's vague, but the, 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 the warnings were there and there was a lot about bin Laden wanting to hijack planes and conduct a terrorist attack inside the United States. It wasn't just known by the domestic intelligence. It was known by foreign intelligence as well. France, Germany, Russia, Iraq, Pakistan, Israel, um, Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar. And really, uh, huge warnings, red flags all over the place. They just didn't know whether, you know, what the specifics, right? So they didn't know the specifics. However, that's not the point. The point being raised here is that this intelligence was known and nobody took any precautions to conduct stricter security measures. And I'll bring something very illuminating up at the end. 
Is there not something? Because this will contradict a lot of things. Something that you could have done, either in terms of screening at the airports, ratcheting down what people could carry on to the airplanes, right. advising pilots about keeping the, the, uh, uh, the door of the cockpit locked and secured. Is right. there nothing that could have been done had you received that information? I think if we had received information as specific as you just laid it out, there are some things that we would have looked at doing. Such as? Well, I think you described several of them. I think we would have also, off the top of my head, listening to how you described it, we would have considered looking at who else might be getting flight training. Uh, Something which other uh, offices of the FBI, particularly in Phoenix, had already suggested be done. Right. Anything else from any of the other members of this panel? I think if, uh, if the air traffic control community had known of such threats, I think our response to stop everyone would have been much sooner. So elaborate on that, if you will. Well, I, I'm relying on the, what I perceive to be the very inquisitive and bright minds of all the air traffic controllers in this nation. And the first hijack had there been a suggestion to me uh, that the hijacker could actually fly the aircraft, I think I would have shut down a lot more a lot sooner. I think everyone would have reacted. I think Boston Center may have reacted yeah, quicker I agree with in uh, requesting uh, the ground stops through their area. Right, because the first airliner to be hijacked was American Airlines 11. Now, this wasn't verified until much later. And then when 175 was hijacked, they were still uh, confused about 11. And then when 76 was to the North Tower, they actually said, oh, um, there was a lot of confusion at the FAA. Now, this is the thing, because the FAA was trying to contact NORAD. Uh, they're trying to get air defense. Meanwhile, they're trying to get, meanwhile, they're running exercises. And so they didn't stop the exercises until all the events of September 11 was done. Um, now they couldn't, they didn't have hot guns, which means that there weren't weapons on these planes during exercise. So they had to go get authorization for that. Then they had to put them on the planes. And that takes a little while. So they go up the chain of command to, uh, you know, and then they had to get the authorization for a shoot down. And with Bush already in Air Force, uh, Air Force One flying around trying to land somewhere um, uh, after he took off out of Florida, you know, he, he didn't realize that, um, uh, no, he had he had tried to get in contact with Dick Cheney, the vice president, and at 10 something, it was a 10 0, 10 16, they finally agreed to a shoot down. But by then, all the planes had crashed, right? Um, so that's, that's another thing. Uh, and also, the FAA was truly unprepared for this. Not, nowhere in history has there been multiple hijackings and never in history has there been hijacking and a deliberate plane crash by Arab fundamentalists inside the United States. So the warnings were there. The intelligence was there that bin Laden wanted to hijack planes and crash them. It's not like um, this was a revelation of sorts. And like I said before, many times over, uh, they had this information, the FBI did, regarding the Bajinka plot. And based on that time. And that was six years ago. Six years prior to 9-11. Type of intelligence. That was the anomaly uh, that I indicated earlier that no one had experience with hijackers who could fly the plane. I appreciate yeah, that's That's surreal when you think about it, right? Because how is it that the FAA is not aware of this? Um, Ali Mohammed, who was arrested at this time, uh, was debriefed by the FBI. He was debriefed by um, Patrick Fitzgerald, who was sitting at the uh, was sitting at the Nine Eleven Commission table just a day prior to the FAA being interviewed. And you know, he basically said that Ali Mohammed said, who is actually a triple spy for the CIA, the FBI, and Al Qaeda, or Bin Laden in which he said that they, you know, Bin Laden did want to hijack planes and crash them. 
Um, and this is years prior to 9-11. Uh, I mean, my goodness, you know, Bin Laden's wish to have a contact in Egypt, uh, fly a plane and crash it into Hosni Mubarak, the president of Egypt, crashing into the uh, Egyptian palace. Uh, so, and that was in the year 1999. I, God sakes, man, you know, the presidential daily brief of August 6, 2001, Bin Laden determined to strike inside the United States, which was information gleaned from the millennium plot of co-conspirator Ahmed Wassam, and he was going to bomb LAX airport. And he told them about uh, Al Qaeda wishing to hijack planes and crash them. Uh, the Pachinka plot, which was gleaned off the interrogation of Abdul Hakim Arad, who himself was a licensed pilot. And it wasn't a professional commercial pilot, but he was a light. He got his instrument rating, and um, he told them that there was a second part of the operation in which sleeper cells were inside the United States, and they were going to get the word that, you know, uh, conduct flight training. They were conducting flight training, and they were going to hijack planes and crash them. So it's, it was all there. The, uh... it, it, was, it was all there. Those comments. Uh, let me uh, conclude with a question about prospective recommendations and whether they've been adopted. Uh, there is such a thing, I'm told, as the Industry Transponder Task Force. Is that an, an organization or group known to you all? Not to me. Not to me. It is not known to me. They've but made a recommendation to remove cockpit the capacity to turn off the transponder. They've made recommendations to lock in the 7500 hijack code uh, after entering that. Well, that's interesting because the 7500 code was not implemented by any of the pilots on 9-11, which gives rise to the conspiracy, which is quite reasonable and something that DJ Thermal Detonator, a phenomenal 9-11 researcher, has um, theorized that some of the hijackers may have been already in the pilot seats. And, um, but, save for the exception of Flight 93, because we already have the cockpit voice recordings where they're fighting with uh, the hijacking team. Um, so there's that, right? But we don't have the cockpit voice recording for 77 because when they found it, it was too damaged and we never found the black boxes belonging to 11 and 175. Code as well. So interesting as other recommendations, but these have not percolated up to any of you? Uh, I, I think the three of us retired, I mean, well over a year ago, and myself well over a year and a half ago, so Fair I, don't, enough. I, don't, I don't know. Uh, do these recommendations make sense to you? Yes, absolutely. I believe um, one of your fellow commissioners asked that earlier. It seems almost obvious not to make it available to someone on the flight deck. We were told, and I'm not sure uh, on the technical side of this, but the, that there is a capability to dump fuel remotely. Yeah. Is that something which resonates with you as a, yeah. as a technological possibility? We were told that it was, uh, uh, in fact, installed on other aircraft. I, I have read about that. I, I don't know much about it in terms of dealing with terrorism, but I have read that and I've read uh, about communication devices to communicate with the flight deck uh, in ways that would not be obvious. Well, the lethality, if you will, of a hijacked airliner piloted by a suicide fanatic uh, is diminished, would you not agree, by the fact that if you subtract 28,000 uh, or so pounds, Yep. of uh, highly combustible fuel. Uh, is that uh, remote capability to dump fuel uh, another suggestion that uh, might have some merit? It, it might, yes, sir. Yeah, and that's the end. Um, uh, if that was implemented on other planes, that's certainly, uh, I, I'm not aware of that. And that would be a great idea. And if that even existed, why didn't that exist on United American Airlines planes? And because um, that certainly would have lessened the damages of 9-11 of for sure.
uh, especially the remote uh, operations tool about dumping fuel from a plane. Uh, you know, it wouldn't have killed as many people as it did in the World Trade Center or in the Pentagon. Uh, but, uh, you know, the planes would have crashed anyway, uh, just without the explosive uh, combustible uh, materials. Now, interesting, because according to an article by uh, Tron.com back in 2005, um, this is two years after the, uh, the one year after the uh, 9-11 Commission report came out that the FAA did receive repeated warnings in the months prior to September 11, 2001 about Al-Qaeda and its desire to attack airliners. Uh, and this was uh, according to an undisclosed report by the commission. 52 warnings from April to September 10, 2001 about Al-Qaeda and bin Laden and their wishes to hijack the airlines and crash them. 52 warnings. Five security warnings mentioned Al-Qaeda's training for hijackings and two reports concerned suicide operations not connected to aviation. And none of them pinpointed specifics. And uh, which is, wow. Because That they never got intelligence reports from the CIA, the FBI, security services, uh, and they tell us about. Spokesman Laura Brown, she said the agency received intelligence from other agencies when it was passed on to airlines and airports. But, quote, she said, we had no specific information about means or methods that would have enabled us to tailor any countermeasures. End quote. What they could have done, however, was implement stricter security measures around the cockpit door. That's what they could have done, and they didn't. And also Brown went on to say that she was, they were, the FAA was in the process of tightening security at the time of the attacks, a little bit too, too late there. And she also went on to say, quote, we were spending $100 million a year to deploy explosive detection equipment at the airports, end quote. Um, unbelievable, right? Like, remember I told you before about the intelligence warnings from foreign countries that were coming in all throughout 2001 about Al Qaeda and their wish to hijack planes. Here you are, the intelligence communities, the members doing the same, and 52 reports from April to September. Specific report, not, I'm sorry, detail, uh, vague reports about. Um, Arab fundamentalist criminal units and uh, hijacking airlines, just not specifics like date and time and what buildings are gonna be crashed into. Um, yeah, so, but still the FAA could have implemented stronger security measures and they didn't. 